And what are we going to talk about today? What are we going to talk about today? Plankton. Plankton. We're going to talk about phytoplankton in particular and something that's very important to the estuary. So um, what I want to start off with is by asking these guys and asking you guys too, where have you ever heard the word plankton before? What about a cartoon? Yes. Oh, SpongeBob. 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 Everybody's heard of plankton because of SpongeBob. And in, in SpongeBob, is plankton good or bad? Bad. Bad guy. But we're going to talk today f about some reasons why phytoplankton is actually a good thing and how it can potentially be bad. So what I want to start off with is um, l thinking about what phytoplankton is. So are phytoplankton big or are they little? They're little tiny, and you've got to be able to have what to look at them? A microscope. Good. You've got to have a microscope to be able to see them. So today we're actually going to be able to look at some images of phytoplankton under the microscope. Something else. Are they plant-like or animal-like? Animal-like. Plant-like because they're phytoplankton, but animal-like is a good comparison for it because zooplankton is actually animal-like. But we're going to be looking at plant-like organisms today. Let me ask you a question. Do they live in the bottom of the ocean or near the surface, if you had to guess? Near the surface? Very good, because they actually conduct something called photosynthesis, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of before. And photosynthesis means they have to have light, they've got to have nutrients, they have to have carbon dioxide, and they then make food for themselves and are able to survive. So we're going we're gonna to look at some of those uh, in just a minute. Another thing is that they are single-celled or they can be chains. And I'm hoping today when we look under the microscope, you guys will see some that are single-celled and chains that have formed chains. Phytoplankton, they cannot control where they go. They are at the mercy of currents and tides. So why do you think phytoplankton are important? Why do we even care that they're in our water? They help our environment. How do they help our environment? You think things feed on them? You ever heard of the word producers? Yes. Where are they in the food chain? Bottom or the top? Bottom. You are absolutely right. Producers are at the bottom and phytoplankton actually feed all the other animals in the ocean. So without phytoplankton, you're not going to have fish, you're not going to have sharks, you're not going to have whales, you're not going to have any of those animals. So phytoplankton are absolutely necessary for life in uh, the ocean. Another reason why they're important. What do we have to breathe in order to survive? What type of air? Oxygen. Oxygen, excellent. And without oxygen, we can't live, right? Well, phytoplankton produce about 60 to 70% of the oxygen on Earth. That's a lot of oxygen. So without that, we wouldn't be here. So phytoplankton, are, those tiny little things are so important. We are going to take a look at some of the phytoplankton now. And I've got right now a sample under the microscope that I took this morning, actually, here at Fort Johnson, about 10 o'clock. But if you look at it, I'm going to actually use my little pointer arrow here to point out some of, some of the phytoplankton we see. Look at this coil. What does that look like to you guys? Spring. spring. A spring. It does. It looks like a spring or a bed spring. That, that would be in a car. <laughs> that, that would be in your car? Yeah, kind of looks like that. It's actually a, a species of phytoplankton that we call Guanardia. Can y'all say Guanardia? Guanardia. Guanardia. And it's really cool because sometimes you'll see it like a spring and sometimes you'll see it just in a circular form. Look at this. Might not be as exciting as some of the others, but it's a really important one. Look where my arrow is. What does that look like to you? Uh, a screw. A screw or a worm. A worm. We can call it a ladder sometimes. That species is called Skeletonema. It looks like a spine. It looks like a <laughs> spine. It does. It looks like a spine, which helps you remember the name. That's the favorite food for oysters. How cool is that? And I might, I'm going to focus in on it right in the middle. Check this one out. It looks like a little tiny, um, looks like a little tiny light. Looks like a little light going beep. If you're I can't remember what it's called. This one it has a fancy name. It's called Odontella. 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 And how many spines does it have? Uh, six. Eight. 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 Absolutely. It has eight spines, and that's what helps us to identify them. Whenever we see one with eight spines, we know it's Odontella. 
So this is another one that we find commonly in our water here in Fort Johnson, and a beautiful one that actually makes chains. Another thing I wanted to talk with you guys about is uh, phytoplankton bloom. I got an exciting call about, gosh, about an hour and a half ago from my boss, Dr. Morton, and he said there is a bloom of phytoplankton right now off the shore of Florida that is moving north towards Georgia and South Carolina. And this bloom of phytoplankton called Carinia brevis is actually one that can produce toxins. So before we talk about the toxins, we need to talk about what a phytoplankton bloom is. And a phytoplankton bloom is when phytoplankton gets so many nutrients that it blooms like crazy. It grows out of control. The population somewhat explodes. Think about your, the house plants. Basically they're overpopulated? Kind of like they're overpopulated, yeah. But if you have house plants and you put a lot of fertilizer on those house plants, what's going to happen to those plants? They're go they might die. Or they might start to droop. Or they might grow like crazy because they have all those nutrients in that fertilizer feeding them. Well, it's the same idea with phytoplankton. When the conditions are right, the salinity is right, the temperature is right, and the nutrients are just perfect and optimal for them to grow, they can grow out of control. And we have a bloom of Carinia brevis right now off the coast of Florida. So the way we monitor those, because the group that I work for actually has volunteers that work for us, and we monitor phytoplankton, and we try to find out where those blooms are occurring and why they're occurring, um, I actually contacted our volunteers this afternoon to ask them to go out and sample the water. And what do we sample the water with? This net. Hold it up high so everybody can see. He, Kevin asked me a great question a little while ago and said, how on earth do you catch those little microscopic uh, plants? And I said, you know what? This is what we use. We use a net, and it's a 20 micron mesh net. And we pull that through the water. We actually, and I've got a bottle here. If one of y'all wants to hold that bottle up, we attach that bottle to the end of the net. And we pull it for about three minutes in the water and collect our phytoplankton sample that we just looked at. So all of our volunteer groups along the coast actually have this net and they take samples for us and enter that information into a database. We have many school groups that do it for us along the coast. Now, what does the word toxic mean to you? If you hear that word toxic, what, what, do, you, what do you think? Toxic means pollution. Toxic means pollution? Some kind of poisoning? Poisoning? You think it's gonna hurt you or help you? Hurt you. It could potentially hurt you. So when you hear that word toxin, you know that's not necessarily a good thing. And what we look at actually is how that toxin from the phytoplankton impacts marine mammals, how it, that toxin can impact us, and the way that can happen is through eating shellfish or eating certain types of fish that could have that toxin. Now, let me stress something. We've got thousands and thousands of species of phytoplankton less than 5% of them produce toxins. I wanted to also talk about, because we talked about toxins and how they can be poisonous, right? There are other ways in which phytoplankton can actually be harmful, and it's things you might not necessarily think about. One is that if you have all these phytoplankton blooming, and then they all die, and this was actually talked about in a session this morning, all of those phytoplankton, as they die, can actually cause the level of oxygen in the water to decrease. What happens when there's no oxygen in the water? What happens to the fish? They die. They die. And you get fish kills. And fish kills can happen when there isn't very much oxygen in the water. Another thing, and this is really weird to think about, some phytoplankton have really long spines coming off of them. And when it, there's a bloom of phytoplankton with really long spines, those spines can get tangled in the fish gills. And don't the fish have to have those gills to be able to breathe? Yeah, so if they've got all this phytoplankton tangled up in their fish gills, what's going to happen to the fish? They could die. They're going to die. So these are some other ways in which phytoplankton blooms can actually be harmful. But remember, phytoplankton is also a really good thing because it, it provides oxygen to us and it provides a lot of food for other um, organisms. So phytoplankton are very important to, um, to us and to uh, the animals that live in the ocean.